you, Alejandra, uh, and thank you everyone for sh showing up at uh, last night's uh, festivities. I'll uh, start with a very brief introduction, uh, some motivation about uh, uh, my personal motivation, I would say, uh, for uh, why I started looking into this and why also I think uh, people, uh, that there is renewed interest on, on this field. So there are several reasons uh, to be interested in uh, conformal field theories in uh, higher dimensions. One, and by the way, whenever I say higher dimensions, I mean five and six, uh, basically. Uh, the, uh, uh, so we have learned over the past few years that they, once you get a field theory, an interesting conformal field theory in uh, <coughs> higher dimensions, you also generate uh, field theories, interesting field theories in uh, lower dimensions. That not necessarily obvious um, that when you compactify a CFT, say in six dimensions on a Riemann surface, you should get a, a CFT in four, but uh, uh, it happens very often. And, uh, once it does, um, those field theories have uh, very interesting duality properties, for example. Also, it's uh, an intriguing challenge to study field theories in higher dimensions, because if you uh, just repeat doing what you've always done, uh, say you start with a um, normal uh, gauge T reaction, Yam Mills, uh, then you uh, discover that this is a uh, a relevant operator in any dimensions higher than four, um, just because the uh, G uh, Mills is no longer dimensionless. And uh, uh, this, uh, as a consequence, the theory is going to be strongly coupled in the UV, which means that you haven't actually defined uh, the theory. In other words, I mean, in the old uh, type of language, you would say it's uh, non renormalizable. And if you think about it, this is a very similar problem to another uh, kinetic operator which is uh, um, relevant, uh, which is this one, uh, which is relevant in any dimensions higher than uh, two. So, you know, perhaps uh, this type of theoretical challenge can teach us uh, something useful in other contexts. But I uh, personally, my, uh, my main motivating um, a factor to look at, uh, at six dimensional and five dimensional theories again was uh, that, well, after all the progress we uh, did um, on ABGM, well, I didn't do <laughs> anything really, but uh, after, after we as a community learned um, a lot about M2s, many people thought that perhaps this is the uh, right time to look again at the problem, um, the notorious problem of uh, M5 brain stacks. So uh, it's already a challenge, uh, just as a very quick review. It's already a challenge, a li little bit of a challenge to write an action for, um, for a single M5 uh, because of the problem that uh, you have uh, two form potentials which have this property. They have a constraint that the uh, field strength should be self-dual. And uh, writing an action for, for this is not obvious at all, but uh, although there is a proposal by Pasti, Sorokin, and Tonin, so you might think, okay, uh, that's done. But then there's another challenge, which is that um, there are indications that the number of degrees of freedom goes like n cubed. So, uh, moreover, even if that weren't the case, it's not obvious how to non abelianize uh, theories, theories with uh, two form potentials. On top of that, we also have the, uh, the, the old question also that, uh, well, there is no um, natural coupling because we are in M-theory and there is no G-string. On the other hand, you might feel that that was, well, um, that was also the case for the M-2s and then we learned, basically in that case, we generalized the problem by putting the M-2s at a singularity and that introduced another parameter that eventually uh, led to progress. So, okay, so this last point is not even here on the slide because perhaps we have learned some tricky way to get around it and we'll see something about this, uh, about this later. Anyway, so I feel, uh, especially this last, um, is the, this last uh, item on the uh, slide is the reason for uh, renewed interest in, uh, in assaulting the problem of uh, higher dimensional field theories. Although, uh, actually, this problem was already, uh, so the first uh, set of breakthroughs uh, happened already in the mid-90s with the second string revolution. Um, the 
this uh, two comma zero theory that I, uh, I mentioned in the previous slide, for example, was uh, discovered back then, and there was a bit of a surprise uh, because of the problem that I mentioned earlier. You might think naively that uh, perhaps quantum field theories in uh, dimensions higher than four don't, uh, I don't know, don't even exist. But string theory provided uh, evidence that they, in fact, existed. Uh, well, in more recent times, the reason I think I'm giving this talk is that in more recent times, um, there have been, um, like I said, there has been renewed uh, interest. And, well, for example, uh, there has been very recently uh, some sort of classification, a tentative, I would say, classification of uh, uh, six dimensional uh, theories with this amount of supersymmetry. This is uh, half as much as the, um, what is expected for. A theory of, of uh, coincident and fives, uh, and uh, then uh, we'll see there is also now by now a classification of theories that have uh, holographic dual at least in type two, uh, which is probably I mean very likely all there is. And so the, these two actually these two points are even uh, talk together nicely. So the, uh, we see the beginning of a um, larger story. The, actually, the, uh, parallel to this, there has been uh, uh, also there have been uh, many nice results on um, uh, explicit computations, following on the um, other computations performed in four and three dimensions. People also managed to uh, do uh, very interesting things in uh, uh, five and six dimensions. Uh, but uh, well, I'm not going to review any of that today. So here's the plan. Then, uh, start with some very general remarks uh, about uh, field theories in uh, six dimensions, uh, just to put us all on the same page. Uh, and then I'll uh, <clears throat> look at a, a certain class of theories that are, um, I call linear quivers, which are precisely the ones that I uh, said ha uh, have a holographic dual. I said that there's a classification of uh, theories with the holographic duals, and these are the ones. And then I'll, uh, I'll uh, review very, I mean, uh, perhaps a bit vaguely, but I'll, I'll give you the main elements of uh, this uh, classification results that appeared in the concept, uh, contest of uh, F theory. And then we look at a little bit of some, so after we uh, define these theories in uh, six uh, dimensions, then we can start uh, looking down, because after all, we don't live in six dimensions. I mean, that, uh, one motivation uh, to look at this was to learn enough about six dimensional field theories that eventually we could apply what we have learned to the problem of m -5. But another motivation was to study what happens once you compartify, because the, uh, um, the expectation is that you'll find a uh, plethora of new field theories with interesting properties. So uh, people have also started looking into that, and this, is the, this will be the very last part of my talk, if time permits. So uh, let's start with the field theory. Uh, this will not be particularly deep, but uh, um, like I said, it's to put us all on the same page. In six dimensions, the minimal supersymmetry is called like this, not just n equals 1, but n equals uh, 1 comma 0, uh, basically because of the fact that uh, the conjugate of a carospinon and six, um, six Lorentz and dimensions is the same chirality. So they, basically, you can, it's like in two dimensions. You can have uh, carol supersymmetries very easily. And this is the one. Uh, where most of the work has happened, which is half as the, uh, the amount of supersymmetry that, again that you have for M5s. And uh, let's say, you know, now it depends how you count it, let's say it supercharges, it's, uh, you should think of it as n equal to 2 in uh, four dimensions. And it already has an asymmetry, even though it's the minimum amount you can have, uh, and that's sp1, let's say, it would be sp2 for 2 comma 0, sp2 is so 5 and SP1 is SU2. Sorry for, uh, I mean, I am aware that uh, people follow different conventions. Uh, uh, this would be USP2 for uh, in, other, in other conventions. Uh, so how about the multiplets? I mean, uh, here uh, I listed the ones that I'm going to be using. No surprise about the vector, uh, structure of the vector multiplet and the hyper multiplets. The, hyper multi uh, the vector multiplets have a, uh, a vector. Well, I depicted it in this way with this uh, spin -over. I mean, this is uh, uh, fun to just show how the number of alphas increases in uh, each uh, multiplet, uh, but uh, it's to be fine, just a gimmick. Uh, 
But, so you have, as usual, in the vector multiple, uh, the gauge in on the gauge field, and then in the hyper multiple uh, four scalars, this A uh, is an asymmetry index that goes from one to two. And uh, then some uh, hyperino. But the tensor multiple, the, the, the relative novelty in six dimensions is this uh, uh, tensor multiple, which has one scalar, and then if you add one alpha, you have a, a fermion. Uh, alpha, two. in case I didn't say it yet, it's a, the, is a fermionic index. And then you have this H alpha uh, beta here. This was anti-symmetric, and if you anti-symmetrize to four, so S4, you get a six, which is the fundamental of SO6, and so it's a mu. Uh, here, if you symmetrize and you do uh, some work, you realize that it's uh, exactly the fee strength of, uh, the, uh, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, Karel his strength. Now, uh, just to uh, perhaps uh, uh, get us into a slightly more familiar terrain, if you put a tensor multiple and a hyper multiple together, it's a field content of a 2,0, so called 2,0 tensor multiple, namely the field content uh, on a single M5. And uh, as I cross track, you see that, I don't know, uh, there's this a single scalar here and there are four scalars here for a total of five scalars which is okay with the SO5 that I mentioned earlier, the asymmetry, but also with the fact that an M5 uh, is six dimensional, so 11 minus uh, six is five, and so there are five times uh, fluctuations for uh, M5, and so this is the uh, 2,0 tensor multiple. Uh, you'll see actually why I'm insisting on uh, this uh, type of interpretation, because later on uh, we'll see that the field theories, many of the field theories that I talk about have a, uh, some kind of interpretation uh, in terms well, not quite in terms of M5s, uh, but uh, perhaps more in terms of NS5s. But uh, the, as you know, the two are related by dimensional reduction. So um, let's start uh, uh, looking at this. Like I said, I mean, this is a problem if you uh, want to start uh, just looking at uh, this field theory not on its own because of the fact that the uh, Yamil's uh, kinetic operator uh, is a relevant operator, so the G Yamil's is dimension for, so if you start with only this, you're doomed. Uh, into failure, uh, but, uh, well, let's proceed anyway. I mean, the, uh, I want to point out that there's another problem, which is even more pressing. Uh, namely, uh, there's a Gagino here, and there's a danger that uh, uh, this will give an anomaly, because this is a Karel uh, object. So uh, then you immediately see that we need other fermions to cancel this anomaly. So that we have, uh, I mean, this gauge multiple already has two very serious problems, but uh, uh, well, let's try to combine it with other things and perhaps the two problems will uh, solve each other, who knows. Uh, how do we cancel this anomaly here? Now, to be clear, uh, this is not my work at all. This is, uh, this is very old stuff, uh, but let's review it. So. Um, as usual, a uh, uh, useful way to encode anomalies in any dimensions is to go two dimensions higher. And as many people in the audience uh, know um, much better than I do. And in particular, you start with a certain um, eight-form uh, polynomial, let's say. And uh, well, what do I mean by that? So for example, two things that appear uh, in this uh, Anomaly polynomial is trace of f uh, wedge f wedge f wedge f wedge f, which I will denote just by uh, trace f to the four, and trace f wedge f times trace wedge f wedge f, which is here. So these are two prominent guys that appear uh, in this anomaly polynomial. Then, I mean, there are, uh, there are more things. There are um, gravitational anomalies and so on, but these are the ones we should worry about because they contain the fifth strength of the uh, gauge field which uh, we should cancel, because otherwise the gauge symmetry is anomalous. Uh, do you have this uh, descent um, formalism, by the way, so in case you don't remember that, I mean, this, uh, you start with this A-form polynomial, and uh, it's a formal object that allows you, with, uh, with a couple of steps, to arrive to the, uh, this I6, which is really the variation of the action on the gauge transformation. Now, this trace f to the fourth, uh, can be cancelled uh, uh, just by adding um, more uh, fermions. I mean, if, if you uh, remember in the previous slide, the, hyper, the hyperinos, I should have uh, stressed it back then, but the hyperinos had a uh, different chirality. So, well, uh, you can think, let me add enough of them so that um, they also contribute something like this, but with the 
but, uh, with opposite sign, and if you take them to be in the fundamental, which I will do, uh, then it takes you exactly this number. Uh, and that's uh, the number of um, uh, flavors, let's say, I mean, uh, hypers in the fundamental should be twice the number of uh, colors. This is actually for SUK, uh, should, SUN, SUNC. Uh, there is a parallel story for uh, other classical groups, but I'll, I'll skip that because in the end we'll uh, see uh, more interesting stuff with the uh, exception gauge groups. But for now, let me stick to SUN. Uh, still, even after you manage this, uh, there is a, a remaining term here. And what do you do about this? Well, the observation is that this is a square. So whenever you see an anomaly polynomial uh, that is factorized, uh, you immediately, uh, perhaps if you have worked with anomalies long enough, you immediately think, oh, OK, perhaps I could apply a Green-Schwartz uh, mechanism. And indeed, this is what people have done. Uh, you add a term to the, to the action, which uh, looks like this, and then you, uh, there's a certain, I mean, given, to, uh, given that I8 is factorized, this I6 will also be factorized, and it turns out that if you uh, add the transformation um, roughly like this, um, this will uh, exactly cancel uh, this term. In, six, uh, in this context, it's actually uh, important that uh, it's not, long, not just factorized, but even a square. Uh, this has to do with the fact that this B is uh, self-dual. Now, uh, well, okay, so this uh, appears to be a strategy to, um, to cancel the anomalies. So uh, here's the, I mean, a pictorial representation uh, of the theory that we have obtained this way. So we have a, uh, this gauge multiple. This, I mean, this is very common in any dimensions. Uh, there's a round, uh, circle, a round node for a gauge multiple. And then this uh, line here will represent for me a hypermultiple uh, with the tensor multiple. With, uh, why, uh, why both? Because, OK, there are hypermultiples in, uh, just in this number with the nf equal to 2 and c, uh, so as to cancel the trace to f to the fourth. Uh, but then there's also a tensor multiple to cancel uh, the residual uh, term trace f square square. So notice also that in other dimensions, uh, when we see quivers of this type in other dimensions, we also often uh, see this uh, condition to be relevant, uh, an f equal n to c. But it's usually uh, a condition that you add if you want to have the theory to be conformal. In this case, uh, it's much stronger. Uh, it's uh, imposed by anomaly uh, cancellation. Now, uh, yeah. Here I've even added the action. So the action is surprisingly hard to find in <laughs> literature. So uh, in the old days, people uh, often didn't bother, uh, let's say. But um, well, uh, with years, there has been progress. And for example, the, the, uh, there's this series of nice papers uh, by some Levin Seyskin and Wimmer, uh, who <laughs> looked at a uh, very general uh, set of actions. And so if you uh, work with the with uh, those papers, uh, the, um, it's easy to uh, write it down. Of course, it's a, a pseudo action in the sense that you have to supplement it uh, with a um, with a chirality constraint uh, uh, on top, let's say. Uh, but there is also work to uh, achieve a PSD-like, a past or a tonin like uh, formulation. But anyway, so uh, this uh, action is not that uh, peculiar. I mean, there's this term that I was talking about before. But I want you to, to focus on this one. So in particular, on the trace f square, which has now a phi in front. So um, actually, uh, let me uh, say a couple more things about this. Uh, you see. The, before, we had uh, trouble uh, because this was dimension four. But uh, what is the dimension of a scalar in six dimensions? Well, we have d phi square, so d phi should be dimension three, so phi should be dimension two. So we have dimension two times dimension four. Now the kinetic operator has, a, uh, has dimension six. It's a, now a marginal operator, so uh, there's nothing. You don't have to put a dimension for coupling in front. That sounds already a uh, lot more promising than what we started with. So I don't want to claim that we have already uh, solved our problems uh, to define uh, UV Lagrangian, but I think we are on the right track. Uh, why don't I want to claim it? Uh, well, because 
If you try con to contest this action, it's not going to be, be easy. If you uh, don't give a VAP, for example, to this phi, uh, well, now you have, um, okay, you may have the right um, dimension, but it's a kind of uh, funny action to, to quantize because the uh, phi equals zero, for example, the action becomes uh, strongly coupled. So, uh, okay, th we are still not done. But let me get going, and then we'll see that uh, string theory actually uh, will uh, suggest that at exactly phi equals zero, there should be some CFT. I'll get back to this point. But for the time being, uh, let me uh, point out that there are other general theories that we can write in this class. So uh, I, here I just rewrote the same thing. I mean, then I have uh, uh, two NC flavors. Uh, this uh, square is, here is just to underline the flavor group, and here I just didn't make manifest all of it. Uh, but then uh, I can get an idea that uh, perhaps uh, I could uh, gauge this flavor group. To make it a gauge uh, a group, but then if I make it a gauge group, then from its perspective, I mean this new gauge group would have only NC flavors. So perhaps I should uh, attach more flavors on this side so that now the condition uh, an F equal to NC holds again. So here is what I obtain in this way, and of course <laughs> we can uh, keep going and I can obtain a chain like this. This will be an important theory in what follows, and we, uh, I, I'll show you that it has uh, uh, some, it is related in an interesting way to the theory that we are really after, the theory of uh, um, M5s in uh, string theory. Now, uh, as you can see, at each node, this uh, condition is, uh, um, is met. Uh, but this is not the only way I could have proceeded, uh, here's another possibility. What happens here? Well, you see that this gauge group uh, 2 has 1 plus 3, 4 flavors. And here, well, the I should have probably written the next here, it would be a 4. Then 2 plus 4 equals 3. So it's twice <coughs> the number of colors, and uh, it works. So this is a linearly ascending chain that you uh, probably have seen in other dimensions, but here uh, it kind of gets singled out by this anomaly condition already. And here, there is a <laughs> so then at some point you can play with the combinatorics. Uh, perhaps there's a little physics in this, but uh, I mean, the physics is the same, uh, let's say, that what we have just uh, discussed. On, for that reason, I'm not really writing an action for uh, this quiver. Uh, but uh, I think you got the uh, general idea. And, and now uh, you see, okay, so here this 10, for example, has 10 plus 10, 20 flavors, and it's all right. But uh, this guy, 10, uh, has 9 here and 10 here, and so it wouldn't work. But then for that reason, I added some extra flavor here that I'm not gauging anymore. Okay, why not? Why, uh, why don't I uh, proceed, for example, from here saying that this is an E2 and I keep adding stuff? Uh, well, in this example, actually, I couldn't be doing it, but uh, there is a, so this would be a combinatorial process. As you can see, actually, here it wouldn't work uh, because uh, it, uh, 7 is already more than twice 2. But, well, you can start playing this uh, game in general. Surprisingly, uh, no one really did it uh, systematically until recently. Um, but uh, there's a, uh, a general classification uh, um, right now, very recently. But these are classical actions. Uh, so uh, perhaps I will not insist on, on, on that classification. Uh, uh, I would like to insist instead of theories like this because I uh, will see that these have a realization in string theory and they have a holographic dual. So, and that, uh, but for the time being, let me point out a uh, property. I mean, a theory like this has a, uh, a plateau here where the ranks are all equal, a core, and then it has two uh, tails where this, uh, the, the gauge groups go down. So uh, in the action, you'll find, just by uh, generalization what we saw before, uh, always a kinetic term like this. And let me repeat, uh, the scalars have dimension two, and uh, the kinetic, uh, so the tracer squares dimension four, so this thing looks uh, promising. And this is uh, really this uh, 
phi minus phi, so this difference of phi uh, plays the role of uh, 1 over Dream is uh, square. This is a slight complication from respect to what we saw before, but it's just a uh, renaming. We'll see why I, I uh, prefer the basis where they, um, the phi's appear like this. Now, actually, if you are confused, so if this is the i's uh, gauge group, this is the i's uh, tensor, a scale, is the scalar in the tensor, and this is the i plus 1, uh, then uh, this is what I'm talking about, and this is what appears in the arch. So, uh, uh, just to uh, repeat uh, this point, which I made in the simplest uh, case, when at the point where uh, this will go to zero, then it says if GM is goes to infinity, and we have a strongly coupled theory. So, perhaps we can find some interesting theory there. If we just had this field theory analysis, I don't feel we could uh, go further, much further uh, in our analysis, but uh, now uh, string theory will come to the rescue soon. But by the way, uh, so uh, as a last point, in, uh, I, I do want to make a last point about field theory. If such a CFT exists, we can already estimate its number of degrees of freedom. How, how is that? Well, this was uh, shown in a couple of um, interesting papers uh, last year. Um, remember that anomaly polynomial. Uh, so after you have canceled the gauge anomalies with the green, uh, green Schwartz sorry, um, mechanism, uh, you can now look at the other anomalies. And uh, so those that I told you all, ignore those. For example, the gravitational anomalies. Now uh, let's look at those also. I, I won't write a formula, but they can be computed with uh, similar methods. And it turns out, uh, so in particular, you can also look at the anomaly of, this, uh, of the asymmetry. The asymmetry is an SU2, and you can also compute its anomaly. It's a global symmetry, so you shouldn't cancel it. It, it can be there, it can be non-zero. And moreover, uh, in, uh, from my experience in other dimensions, uh, you would expect that this uh, should be related by supersymmetry to the Weyl anomaly, which is an important indicator of the number of degrees of freedom in a theory. Uh, surprisingly, this hasn't been worked out until very recently also, uh, so these are all signs that uh, <laughs> the field was underdeveloped, uh, let's say, uh, but it is now. And uh, so it turns out that there's a formula relating the SU2R and the gravitational anomaly to the, the Weyl anomaly. So, uh, and this A is really, the, the, uh, in, a sense, uh, in a sense, the same guy that, uh, uh, for which an A uh, theorem has been proven in four dimensions recently. And it turns out, when you do the computation generically for those linear equivalent theories that uh, we have seen, that the, uh, the A scales like the number of gauge groups to the cube. This is a, a much, uh, usually you might think for a weakly coupled theory that the number of degrees of freedom should be the number of fields in the theory. But this is much larger. So it indicates that indeed there should be some CFT at that mysterious point in the, uh, at the origin of the moduli space. And moreover, you see this uh, scaling with the cube. Uh, this might uh, remind you of the cubic scaling that uh, I had in the uh, first slide. Now, uh, let me, so I've said already a few times that the string theory will come to uh, the rescue. Uh, let, Finally, this is the time where it comes to the rescue. So, uh, this is the equivalent we uh, saw before. But I told you, okay, there will be a string realization. You probably know already where I'm going with this uh, because if in uh, lower dimensions, similar quivers have a very well known uh, a string realization with intersecting brain diagrams, which here, oh my god, I put too many brains. Sorry, this looks like. Oh, this doesn't look good. I should, <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, I'll try to explain. So uh, these uh, dots here are no longer the gauge groups. So don't be confused. Uh, these are the NS5s, okay? Each of the dots are NS5s. And here, this, uh, uh, this C of black was supposed to be a stack of uh, D6s, um, more or less on top of each other. And the, but the number of these D6s uh, changes because from time to time, the D6s end on an NS5. There's actually a condition that says that uh, this is related to where you are in this diagram, because there, there are also D8s. 
vertical d8s. Well, okay, so it, uh, just to put you in more familiar terrain for a second, if you uh, go back uh, uh, to lower dimensions, uh, for example, you might have d3s here with d5s and ns5s, and this would be the original Hanani Witten papers, engineer, uh, paper art. engineering three dimensional field theory is more or less of the same uh, formal shape. Although, I mean, like I, under, I stress, the physics is uh, very different. The combinatorics I'm going to show you, though, is basically the one of uh, Anani Witten. Uh, one element is that this D8 um, sources uh, uh, the zero form flux, which is called F0, the Roman's mass. And that, uh, when you have a non zero Roman's mass, uh, the number of uh, 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 D6 is ending on a, a, an S5 is fixed in a certain way. That is actually related to the anomaly condition we uh, saw uh, a few minutes ago. Anyway, um, so how does, what is this engineering I'm talking about? So you, you see this stack of uh, D6s uh, lying on top of each other. Uh, engineers engage group, just for the usual reasons that the stack of uh, D brains uh, gives uh, uh, UN, or then uh, D brains uh, engineers a UN gauge theory. So this, uh, you see, is connected to this node. So in the picture, there was supposed to be eight D6s right here, and it's related to this uh, U8. And uh, then there are, uh, uh, so there are these vertical D8s which are crossed um, in correspondence of this other seven here, and this corresponds to these uh, um, two flavors. So these uh, uh, crossing brains uh, give rise to flavors. This is also well known in, uh, from other dimensions. And another important element, uh, which I perhaps didn't write on the slide, is remember that to any link that was associated not just hypers, but also a tensor multiple. Well, that uh, is reasonable because on an NS5, we should have a tensor. That's the same tensor that lives on an M5 when you live to M theory. So that tensor that we talked about before now lives on this uh, NS5, which is indeed, uh, so if you want, uh, the slightly confusing um, um, uh, uh, fact about this engineering is that the nodes become links and uh, uh, these horizontal uh, things which are the D6s become nodes. But well, well, once you get the hang of it, it's just combinatorics. Now, uh, also the, uh, the phi's that I have talked about before become the positions in this direction, in this, uh, let's say, sixth uh, direction, and that uh, the d8s and 7, 8, 9, and if you come the dimensions, it all works, uh, of the ns5s. And that's also reasonable, because from other, uh, from experience in other dimensions, we know that the, when you have a bunch of the brains uh, extended from one ns5 to another, the length of this uh, uh, stretch, let's say, is one over GMS squared. So this uh, uh, works well with what we saw in the uh, previous uh, part of the talk. And finally, I told you that the strongly coupled point was, uh, was going to be where uh, the all coincide, because we saw that GM is, uh, is always phi, some phi i plus one minus phi i. So, uh, the CFT point will be represented here uh, uh, with a, by the configuration where all the NS5s lie on top of each other. If I uh, drew that right now, it would be a horrendous mess because there, there are also the D8s on top and the D6s and you wouldn't understand anything anymore. Um, but uh, let's see. We can go back to a configuration. Ah, now this looks better. We can go back to a configuration where uh, that is uh, more apparent by doing this. What have I done? I have moved the, some D8s outside. When you do that, there is this famous Hanani Witten brain creation effect. And uh, they, uh, some D6s get created, like this one or these three ones here. And you can keep going. You can keep going until you reach a configuration where all the D8s are outside. And at that point, it's no longer uh, a mess to imagine that all the ENS files are on top of each other. Now I can uh, draw them as a single big dot in the middle. Okay, why all this gymnastics with, uh, with, uh, with these diagrams? Uh, do they teach you anything really about physics? Well, uh, the brain configuration, for, uh, the uh, supergravity solution for such a brain configuration is not known. 
but the setting brains are uh, tough uh, cookie. Um, there are only very few uh, intersecting brain uh, metrics that are known, and for sure not this one. It is not to me, no, I don't think to anyone. Uh, but recently, the, the New Horizon limits of these brain configurations were found. OK, it would be more correct, perhaps, to say that some ADS7 solutions were found, or rather, that all ADS7 solutions in type 2 were classified, and that I claim that they are the New Horizon limit of this, uh, um, for these brain intersections. I will justify my claim in a couple of slides with what I think is non-trivial evidence, but uh, to be sure, it's not like I have this brain configuration metric and then I can take the New Horizon limit uh, like we can do for the D3 say. But, uh, well, let's see uh, what these uh, ADS7 solutions look like. Uh, like I said, like I mentioned, this is a classification. These are all, I mean, more or less all the, all the ADS7 solutions in uh, type 2 um, are now known. Uh, well, today I'm going to show you uh, most of them, let's say. And they look like this. Uh, so what is this? This is supposed to be the internal space. And this is in type 2A because after all the brains we had were also in type 2A, the 6s, the 8s. And now, these guys here, so, uh, sorry, this represents an S2 vibration over an interval, so this direction here should be thought of as an S2. And the S2 uh, starts very small and then expands, 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 and then shrinks again. So the whole thing is topologically a trisphere. But there are these uh, creases here, these folds, and they represent uh, the 86 bound states, which are, uh, I claim are the remnants after the New Horizon limit of these guys. The reason we have an S2 at all is that is exactly that it realizes, that, so the S2 um, the rotation group is uh, SO3, which uh, realizes the, um, the S, uh, asymmetry of the field theories. Now, if you want to make the, uh, the correspondence more uh, precise, uh, more, so there are some things that work like in uh, the usual holography. The number of NSPs that I had in this picture now has gone away, it has become flux. So it will become a certain flux integer, this H uh, integrated uh, along this uh, three manifold. And the number of D6 descending on a D8 becomes the D6 charge of each of these uh, bound states. Uh, let me <coughs> show you something more about the combinatorics. So, um, here is a typical theory, the one I showed you already a couple of times. And here is a graph of the, of the uh, well, this uh, spoils the surprise a little bit. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a graph of the ranks as a function of the position. You see, I mean, we have first a 4, then a 7, uh, 8, 9, 10, but then it stays 10 for a while, then it goes down again. So this is the plateau I was referring to before. And all these uh, linear pivot theories are of this form. So, well, okay, so it's a concave uh, function always because uh, this is basically because of the anomaly cancellation condition. And so if it's concave, let me plot also the, uh, the derivative. And it turns out, okay, so here's the, the derivative here, the slope, if you will, is uh, four minus seven, which is three, seven minus four, which is, um, Sorry, 0 minus 4 is 4 first, then 7 minus 4 is 3, and then 8 minus 7 is 1, and then 1 again, 1, and then 0 for a while because we have the plateau, and then it becomes negative because it starts uh, going down like this. So as you see, I didn't just plot the, the slope, but I also filled it in with uh, uh, boxes. These things, uh, so this graph really looks like two Young diagrams. <coughs> So, uh, combinatorially, these quivers are characterized by the length of this uh, interval and two Young diagrams. Now, moreover, uh, so now I, I want to tell you how in, the, in, the, in this uh, New Horizon limit, uh, these are related to the, so this, this data are related to the D8s. So, <coughs> well, basically, whenever you have a jump in the Young diagram, it should correspond 
to one of these uh, uh, objects here. Or if you want, uh, if you go all the way up, the jumps correspond exactly to the need to add a flavor, an extra flavor to the side of the chain. Uh, but this is reasonable because, okay, so you see the idea is that this, is, uh, this one represents this one D8 here, this two represents the uh, stack of two D8s here, and this one, uh, another one D8, and so on. This two represents this two. So this is the combinatorics of this uh, uh, neurosm limit. It's, uh, it's reasonable, you know, because that, uh, in other contexts, uh, uh, say in ADS5, people have uh, put tried to put uh, D7s, for example, to introduce flavor. And then there was a problem on describing the, the back reaction. Here, everything is back reacted already. And moreover, the metric so, uh, is now uh, explicitly known. And it looks like this in our proper coordinates. Uh, well, what is alpha? Alpha of z is a function which is exactly this uh, slope here, I mean, this uh, graph here. I mean, to be clear. The uh, graph is discrete, of course, the one that comes from the field theory. But the, if you interpolate it with a, a piecewise linear function, you obtain a certain function, which is precisely this alpha that appears in the metric. And those who are uh, well acquainted with uh, the Maldacena, uh, Gerardo Maldacena solutions will see a certain similarity. Those are a bit more complicated, but they, um, I mean, the, these combinatorial features are not, uh, are not too different. And, but to be honest, I, I don't know exactly uh, the, the reason uh, is that for that, uh, apart from the fact that the combinatorics of the quivers is, the, is uh, very similar. Now, let me give you a couple examples. Good. So the delta should be there. The delta is a feature, not a, no, 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 no. not a bug. Let me tell you why. So uh, the, there are the 8s here, and uh, the 8s should give a uh, localized source to the uh, energy momentum tensor. So there is indeed some, some matter living there which is localized. That, so uh, perhaps people, when uh, look at uh, brain solutions, when they check the equations of motion, often they disregard this delta because they, I mean, or they, when you uh, solve the equations of motion for a black hole, you never really pay attention to the fact that uh, there is a delta uh, at the origin. But in fact, there is one because that you have localized matter there. And this is no exception. You might say, oh my god, this is a singularity. There is a, del uh, there is a delta in the secondary. But, uh, uh, but the... Oh, wait a second. Oh, I see what you're saying. A delta in the metric. Sorry. This is alpha double dot. No, no, sorry. My mistake, my mistake. I apologize. No, I apologize, I apologize. Uh, this is the one with the double dot. Sorry. This is alpha double dot. This alpha is the double primitive of this. In the, there is a delta, sorry. There is a delta when you take a further a second derivative to compute the equations of motion. Sorry, now I understand your confusion and it's completely warranted, this is a typo. Sorry about that, I'm, uh, I apologize for any confusion and distress uh, uh, that I caused. Uh, now, let me give you a few examples, uh, just, to, just so uh, that this is not too generic. Uh, so, <clears throat> the, this is a case where the two Jan diagrams look like this, and uh, I've worked out the combinatorics. This is our original chain with all the gauge groups uh, being equal. And uh, the brain diagram in this case will look like this, no D8s at all. And uh, so, well, this is what the internal S3 looks like. But then you, in this case, there is no F0 also, so you can lift uh, to M theory, and this is an old friend. It's just an old before the already 7 times S4. This is why I said that this uh, guy, um, bear some relation to the, um, to the theory of uh, M5s. So it's an orbifold of the 2,0 theory. Then another friend is uh, this guy, where, which we also saw before, and it's related to two young diagrams like this. It's another very natural case that you might want to explore. This is the uh, brain diagram, and the, uh, the internal space looks also fun in this case. I mean, the D8s in this case have uh, kind of shrunk, and they have become a bunch of D6s. 
uh, and the, uh, the other side it's uh, the solution is completely regular. And then uh, I can keep going. I mean, uh, here is uh, the quiver for a case with uh, two d8s, for example. Uh, it goes up linearly uh, and then it hits a plateau and then it goes down linearly. Now, uh, this is the combinatorics, but uh, before I move on, let me tell you why I believe that uh, the combinatorial proposal is actually correct. So you will remember that I told you that you can estimate the, the number of degrees of freedom of the origin uh, directly in a, in a field theory by computing a certain anomaly, the Weil anomaly, uh, really, uh, from, uh, computed uh, with the help of the asymmetry anomaly. But in ads there is also a uh, very effective way of estimating the, degrees, uh, the number of degrees of freedom, and it's uh, basically the, the internal volume of the, of the, uh, in the solution, in Einstein frame, uh, to be technical. Uh, so you can do this computation, and you can check with the field theory computation. And if you do it, so there's a certain number here, I mean, that they can compute exactly, but that, uh, it's ugly, so I didn't put it. So let, let's just say that it's one for, uh, in this case, for this theory. Uh, this one scales like k squared and cubed. No longer just like n cubed. Uh, so remember, n is basically the number of, uh, the, the length of this interval, so the number of gauge groups. So this is what I told you earlier. But now there's also k squared. Uh, and this is for this orbifold of the, of the 2,0 theory. Then you can also look at the other example, and uh, in this case, k and n are just the same, uh, so you get uh, k to the fifth, uh, which is very strange. Um, I mean, you might think it's very strange, but it's just uh, this guy. And there's also some different factor. This is what we got in uh, field theory, and we also get the same result from this computation from uh, the SAFT. Okay, but uh, perhaps uh, 4 over 15 is a coincidence, who knows. So let's look at a more complicated example. In this case, this is the uh, thing that you get from field theory, a complicated polynomial, cubic polynomial, of k and n. So in the holographic limit, actually, you take k and n to be both large. So all of these terms are uh, important. And uh, gravity computation reproduces all of these numbers. So, you know, this is uh, non-trivial evidence that the combinatorics work. But in fact, we checked that the comparison always works. We have done it in general. Uh, it's a bit of a long computation, but in the end, after you do the long computation, you slap yourself in the face, and uh, uh, there is a uh, way to understand why it works. This is what I'm working I mean, this is to appear, but I, it's kind of nice. It shows some, somehow that these field theories, the combinatorial, these young diagrams that I showed, all these combinatorial uh, um, uh, drawings, are really a discretization for finite n of the gravity solution. So you, you really see with this anom anomaly computation holography at work. All right, um, so let me now uh, go to the uh, more general CFTs. So uh, now we have this uh, set of examples of, uh, uh, behind our, uh, below our belt, so we can start uh, looking at more general theories. We saw that this was the most general, uh, ex uh, the, this was the simplest example in the case with uh, U and gauge groups. In M theory, so if you lift it to M theory, the D6 is bec uh, become just uh, some ZK singularity, and the NS5s become M5s. And uh, the, I mean, if you work it out, then you get exactly the same quiver that you, we had before. Um, you can also, however, uh, in this case it wouldn't be particularly smart, but you can also work out what, um, uh, this morally will hap what will happen if you tidalized along the transverse direction. The, both the D6s that we had, uh, and uh, possible D7s, if you have, um, I didn't show them in this case, will become D7s. And the NS5s will become just features of the geometry. So that perhaps a better way of depicting the whole thing would be something like this, a chain of, uh, of seven brains. In fact, uh, this is, uh, uh, was argued uh, long ago to happen more generally uh, in a, a duality between N theory and F theory. So only... Yes. Uh, so we we'll get we we'll get to Lagrangians in a second. So uh, let me get back to that in a second. So 
uh, in this case, I, I'm, for now I'm just talking about uh, uh, string theoretical configurations. So this is a generalization where now, instead of having uh, uh, the k singularity, we have some other ad singularity. And uh, uh, there is a claim that uh, this um, theory configuration has a dual in F theory. I won't uh, um, remind you too much how that happens, but this will be the result. Uh, there is a chain of uh, non-trivial S2s, and now instead of having just D7s on them, we have non-perturbative uh, seven brains. And this, as you know, can engineer more general gauge groups than just a UN. I mean the no, no, I mean the seven brains of F theory. I call them non-perturbative because F theory is supposed to be a non-perturbative completion of uh, to B. So, uh, well, this, let me skip that. But uh, now there's your question, if you if you want. So, what the heck is this link? I mean, this, I uh, I have this graph, but what does this mean? For example, uh, even if I put exception, I don't know, E8 here, well, is there any uh, known matter theory uh, that uh, connects an E8 and another E8 so that the whole thing is, um, uh, makes sense? Well, there isn't. So what the hell is uh, going on? Well, uh, to answer this question, in F theory, uh, so you realize that in F theory, this thing is actually singular when you realize a configuration like this. So uh, you better, so to understand what's going on, you better blow up whenever you see a singularity, um, your instinct is to blow up to see, to uh, resolve it and to see what's going on. So this is what the blow up go, uh, looks like. Uh, instead of having this uh, singular point, now you have this uh, new uh, S2 in the geometry. But it turns out that in this particular case, for example, here I'm depicting E8 and E8, uh, these two uh, uh, points where the things touch are also singular. So, well, uh, what do we do? We resolve, we block again. And again and again um, until we get something like this. At this point, so uh, you have to do it several times and, and until you get a certain sequence of seven brains, and the configuration is no longer singular. Now, with the with F theory uh, methods, you can read off the field theory. And so, in particular, you can answer Igor's uh, question. And you get some theory like this. Well, what the heck is this? So, you have, as you see, you have some gauge groups, where now uh, the gauge uh, group is no longer SU or U. But uh, you have a G2 even, or an F4. These are the things that F-theory is good at, uh, realizing exotic um, or exceptional gauge groups. But also, from time to time, you get uh, some uh, stranger stuff. So this is an empty node. Where the, what does it mean? There is no gauge group here, but I depicted it anyway, because it reminds us, because these uh, uh, links here are still going to have uh, some tensor multiples which is what you were asking. So the, I couldn't answer the question earlier because we, we hadn't resolved uh, the configuration. This theory is uh, kind of mysterious. It's known to have one tensor multiple, but uh, somehow it's not just the, ten, the theory of the free tensor multiple because it also has E8 flavor group. And it also appears when you have uh, an M5 near uh, an end of the world um, in M theory which uh, is known to engineer an E8. But uh, so also entertainingly, some, uh, somehow, sometimes you get uh, this empty node between uh, some other gauge groups, and then you realize that every time there's something like that, there is, uh, these two gauge groups are a subgroup of an E8. So really this is, uh, you should think of this as a case where you have uh, E8 flavor symmetry that you have partially gauged. Uh, this, this is uh, the interpretation after the fact, let's say. It just so happens in, MT, in F theory that this always uh, is the case. Now, this actually have been uh, worked out in uh, other contexts, but uh, in the current uh, political climate, um, it's, uh, we uh, try to think what, uh, what, this all, what all this meant for M5s. 
So th this is the configuration at the beginning, where before we resolve, this is the dual of that configuration at the beginning. This is a single M5. I had a chain of M5s, but now let me focus on a single M5. What, uh, uh, what is the analog of doing all those resolutions in N theory? Well, it's natural to conjecture that really in M theory, uh, on top of a singularity, M5s can fractionate. And if you start postulating this, a lot of things seem to work nicely. And in fact, uh, some other people then uh, checked that this is reasonable using uh, alternative features and alternative uh, dualities. So, so this is a nice outcome of all this analysis. Now, we call this type of theories conformal matter theories. And uh, then, uh, uh, um, Ralph and collaborators went, uh, went further and they tried to uh, see everything that you can possibly do in a F theory. And remarkably, there is always uh, associated to any field theory, well, one first result they got, associated to any field theory, you have a certain uh, singularity, meaning when you uh, go to the famous origin of the, of the uh, modular space where the CFT should live, the uh, manifold, the, the base manifold uh, which you use in uh, F theory should be a certain singular manifold, uh, which is always, for some reason, an orbifold of C2, but it's an orbifold of uh, a slightly exotic type. It's not the one that we usually uh, think to be supersymmetric. It's a subgroup of U2, not over C2. You might say, oh, the, uh, we haven't we broken supersymmetry, but well, this is. Uh, Asymmetry, there is also supposed to be a non trivial axial delet that somehow cures the failure, the fact that uh, this is uh, not in SU2. And well, these are known in mathematics and they have also appeared a couple times in physics and uh, later in um, recent years. Also, I mean, that, um, this was a rather coarse classification, just as you what happens uh, when you shrink everything, but uh, they uh, are able to give. Uh, a general classification, and remarkably, what they get is also very similar to our linear quivers uh, that we had before. Uh, on, only those linear quivers, were, I just chose them, I picked them, I don't want to say at random, but just because I, I knew that they had uh, holomorphic, um, the holographic uh, duals, they have a completely different logic that gets them very close to actually um, a linear quiver. And uh, well, I mean, this is to be read carefully. I mean, uh, it's uh, they seemingly simple. Let's say, I mean, here they, all, all these links can be very, uh, sometimes even very long chains, uh, and these nodes are really just D and E gauge groups. But see, I mean, they even have uh, some features like this, where they, uh, that the gauge groups uh, should go up and then down. So I mean, the, it appears that uh, there is some general story here. Uh, indeed, at the beginning, I also told you that there was a way to, go, um, to get from the hour to a picture to the uh, F theory picture with uh, uh, some version of T duality, but uh, okay, uh, I think this I can leave it a bit uh, as a mystery. And also, um, people have started uh, working out several properties of uh, these theories. Okay, uh, so let me end now with the part where we are going to go to lower dimensions. So, uh, if you're, I hope you are not too tired, because um, this is where, supposed to be the part where we are reaping some, oh, okay, some, some fruits of our efforts we have already, in my opinion, we have already uh, obtained. Uh, for example, this nice uh, conjecture about uh, fractional and fives. Uh, but also, I mean, this, this, uh, I think uh, this understanding on linear quivers is uh, really detailed and nice. But perhaps one would also like to have some outcome for four dimensions that can be useful for, um, for even for other fields of physics, who knows? Well, uh, let me start to, uh, since uh, before going to four, perhaps I want to go a little bit to five. Uh, so, the, this time, uh, the peculiarities of a tensor multiple kind of disappear because you can, uh, once you go down, you can dualize it to a vector. Uh, the hyper is uh, still a hyper. And I mean, the, the physics is uh, slightly different, uh, but uh, a little bit more familiar. For example, you can write uh, uh, an n equals one theory in five dimensions in a formalism which is very reminiscent of four dimensional n equals two. 
And actually, uh, using this uh, language and, and uh, a couple of tricks, uh, uh, Cyber was able to argue that uh, the uh, prepotential, which you know in uh, four dimension and equal to, uh, still exists, but uh, it should be, uh, arrive only up to A cubed. So then it's up, uh, you can work out what the uh, theory looks like, and you again have this funny phi phase F square. Phi, uh, a scalar usually have dim has dimension three halves in phi dimension. But uh, the, um, in this case, there is a phi also in front of d phi square. So really, um, this, uh, for this to have dimension phi, phi should, be, should have dimension one. And so this thing, again, has dimension uh, five, which, again, uh, looks a bit promising. Um, and just like in 6D, the, theory, the, the idea is that we are going to find perhaps something interesting at, uh, at the origin. To argue that uh, something interesting does uh, happen, once again, now you know the, uh, you understand the idea, you, you try to engineer it in, in uh, string theory, this is what Cyber did. Uh, and for example, he considered uh, the force close to, uh, or on top, at the conformal point, uh, uh, an 8 possibly with some d8s on top. So the distance between the d4 and the d8 is that phi that we had, and phi equals 0 would correspond to the CFT. Now, um, there are, so later other people consider the other conf uh, configurations. You can try tedializing it. Naively, you get something uh, like this. But later people argue that, uh, well, wait a second. Uh, this can be right because there's uh, a D5 pulling on this NS5. We, we should uh, work it out better. And in the end, you get something like this. There is a, a rule in these diagrams. Um, I'm sorry that I'm being uh, perhaps too pictorial here, uh, but given time, I, I didn't have much of an option. Uh, so there is a rule that, uh, you see, when uh, NS5 meets a D5, they create a bound state, like a 1,15 brain, and they may end on a 1,17 brain, for example, uh, which are, again, objects uh, that we know from, uh, from F theory. But uh, also, this, uh, this can be pulled out, <coughs> you can get uh, purely P PQ fiber in webs. Fine, so this is another realization for uh, another kind of diagram that has been used to realize uh, five dimension field theories. In fact, this is very similar to the Hanani Witten picture again. Uh, usually, in four dimensions, we don't say, I mean, we depict the, the fiber, the NS5 to be vertical. And uh, then we say, oh, all right, we, uh, really they should be uh, logarithmically bent uh, because of the uh, running of the um, GM mills. But in uh, five dimensions, uh, you should, it, uh, it has a dimension, GM mills has a dimension. If you work it out, uh, it goes linearly with energy. And this has to do with the fact that uh, this diagram is now like this. But it's really very similar to the Hanani Witten uh, diagrams. And, uh, well, in turn, let me mention that you can also, uh, there's another, yet another realization uh, of uh, such theories obtained by compatifying M theory on Tori Calabi House. And amusingly, uh, you know that uh, uh, non-compact Tori Calabi House can be associated to diagrams that look just like uh, these webs. And Lung and Bapa were able to show that indeed uh, these two realizations are uh, dual. Now, okay, so summary of this slide, there are several ways to engineer five-dimensional CFTs in uh, string theory. These are all uh, very old. Uh, but uh, more, recently, uh, more recent activity uh, involved uh, studying quivers, which uh, uh, come from more complicated uh, PQ brain webs. And <laughs> even more complicated quivers, uh, were, uh, I mean, this is a very recent uh, uh, new idea, where if you went into this uh, certain seven brains, you find that uh, you have, um, in the end, some of these objects have to uh, keep going forever in a, uh, what people call a tau, uh, tau diagram, because it reminds them of the uh, tau diagrams, so, you know. Uh, <coughs> for example, appearing in a flag of uh, South Korea. And uh, uh, these are supposed to, the fact that there are all these uh, uh, things uh, uh, is supposed to, in, uh, to engineer directly also 
the Kaluza Klein modes that uh, make actually the theory a, a secret a six dimensional theory. So you have uh, a five dimensional theory that has already all the Kaluza Klein power to become a six dimensional theory. Saskia Prince is online. So, uh, okay, let's uh, disregard the Saskia Prince, but uh, uh, let me uh, make a couple. So uh, this, uh, this was uh, my lightning review about five dimensional field theories. Perhaps I'm saying already too much stuff, but uh, bear with me, we're almost done. In particular, we are going down to four. Finally, we are coming home. So uh, let me uh, just remind you of an old story. Uh, if you, uh, well, not so old, uh, maybe six years. Uh, reducing the 2,0 theory on a Riemann surface gives n equals uh, to two d equal four theories, which are, um, which are kind of uh, very interesting. And uh, you, they are not just quivers, uh, but they also have this uh, kind of triangular um, theories, trinium theories, so uh, uh, Toyota calls them. We also have some gauge groups. I don't, I don't have time to review the story, but it's fascinating. There's a, um, there's a very nice visual link, a visual um, relationship between the these uh, pictures with the field theory and the Riemann surface on which you have compatified. And in fact, you can also compatify, quote unquote, with punctures. What does it mean? It means that uh, you have, um, that your Riemann surface uh, has, a, has a certain puncture where also you, uh, you um, around the puncture, uh, there is a possibility of having a non-trivial branched uh, covering. And uh, such things are also have a combinatorics that is uh, uh, nicely summarized by Jan Dagens. Jan Dagens yet again, we, uh, we see them appearing again and again. So this, uh, these triangular theories are characterized by the choice of three uh, Jan Dagens. And uh, this is a nice counterweight to our six dimensional trees that are characterized by two Jan Dagens. And uh, interestingly, you can get such a theory also. For example, the, easy, uh, the easiest uh, theory, this uh, trinium theory, you can also get it from five dimensions and, and uh, from a compatification of 5D web. And so uh, the, this is my, um, the final thing I want to say. So now, so there are all these uh, connections between six dimensions, five dimensions, four dimensions, and now people have started exploring many ways of uh, relating them for also for this 1,0 theories. So this is a very preliminary, let's say, I mean, this is uh, really the forefront of research, but uh, there is evidence that there are, um, I mean, uh, holographically we can see that there are, uh, you can compatify on uh, Riemann surfaces with uh, genius side and two. We have the explicitly, again, the holography duals. And uh, there is uh, some analog of the class S story that the, of the, uh, the auto story that um, I told you before, but only that I told you in the previous slide, but only for this uh, query like this. And then, the, so I told you here, this is uh, uh, for higher genus. You may ask what happens for T2. And some people have argued that very often you don't actually uh, get a CFT at all if you compatify the CFT. And this presumably is the reason we didn't find them uh, holographically. Anyway, uh, so the, at least in this case, they have some understanding of uh, what the theory is. They say that it's not really a CFT, uh, but it flows to, in the end, to two disconnected CFTs. But I, I hope that this case will uh, shed some light on what happens in, for these uh, compatifications higher, higher genus, which is really uh, a CFT. Okay, uh, let me skip this, and uh, here, here are my conclusions. Let me recap. We have a classification of uh, um, six-dimensional CFTs engineered um, uh, from uh, string theory. Uh, I would say it's a tentative classification, but uh, uh, at, the, at this time we don't know of any theory that falls outside. So it's already uh, a good starting point, I think, for further investigation. Then for a subclass of uh, such theories, uh, because they, they really look very similar, and they, they are a subclass, uh, the, the linear quivers uh, that we saw. Um, we have even holographic duals, and we are reaching the point where we can uh, perform detailed comparisons uh, between the two sides, and we find agreement. So uh, by now, we are, uh, I would say there is a pretty strong evidence that the holographic um, duality is correct. And finally, uh, 
now what remains to be done, and it will take a long time probably, is understanding uh, the analog, if you want, of the class S theories, the theories, the Gaiotto theories obtaining by compactifying 2,0 on uh, Riemann surface. Um, also for this uh, 1,0 theories that we have uh, seen today. Thank you.